leading scientist, chief executive of the Buck, which is the leading research institution in the world based in Novato in California. Eric is at the forefront of so many technologies that he's going to speak about now, uh, including the senolytic drugs that um, I was describing earlier on. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Eric Verden. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, uh, Jim and Andrew, for the opportunity to address this, this audience and to participate in this day. Could not be more excited to be here and to uh, spread what we think is a bit of a gospel. Um, so I, I am not, for those of you who know me will realize that I'm not inclined to prophetic statements, but I will start with one. And um, this decade, or pr I predict that this decade will be regarded as a historical inflection point for aging research. And uh, the fact that this meeting, this foundation is actually being set up right now is a, is a good example of this. Um, and this is both from a societal and a scientific point of view. So the rest of this presentation will be focusing on, two, on these two key aspects. We've heard from uh, our first presentation that we are in a rapidly aging society. And I, I, I never tire of showing this slide, even though <laughs> Laura show, show, started uh, with this also. Um, every decade for the last 140 years, we've gained two years of life ex expectancy. So this is absolute, absolutely a remarkable achievement. Um, as, as we've heard also from other speakers this morning, uh, no one knows where we will go in the future. And, uh, oops, I'm sorry. Um, and so I, I will not join the debate in terms of where, whether we're going to live in 98. No one truly knows. Science is, is clearly accelerating at a clip that has been unseen uh, thus far. However, th this picture, as uh, was alluded to earlier, also does not reflect the full truth of what a, a rapidly aging population is today. Um, on, in orange here, I'm, sh I'm showing you that this rapidly growing population is associated with a rapidly growing burden of diseases. In fact, by the time people reach 65 years old, on average, uh, close to 80% carry at least one chronic disease of aging, and I'll be defining these in a few minutes. So many of us actually associate the aging process with disease, frailty, and disability. And so there's, there's a good reason why we're doing this. It is actually the reality of many people who grow old. So these chronic diseases of aging are listed here, and, and you will recognize many of them because we actually have an epidemic of, 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 of these conditions in the US and in most of the Western worlds. And they, they include atherosclerosis, heart attack, stroke, glaucoma, macular degeneration, cancer, osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, hip replacements, hearing loss, sarcopenia, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson, and type 2 diabetes, and, and, and others. And, and the data is actually quite remarkable because age is really associated with a logarithmic and exponential acceleration of the development of these diseases. If you look on the, on the y-axis here, the, the death per 100,000 per year, and as a function of age, you can see that all of these diseases raise exponentially as, as we grow older. Now, this is in contrast to the way medicine is administered today, and I've, I've depicted this image of a silo uh, that illustrates the fact that every disease, every one of these diseases that I've just shown you is driven as the strongest risk factor by your age and the aging process is actually treated and is in, as an individual condition. If you have a heart disease or a stroke, you go see your heart doctor, he will be taking care of preventing your heart disease. We have a series of interventions that, such as statins, such as diet, exercise, stopping smoking, exercising, and so on, that have resulted in a really dramatic decrease in, in, in the rates of heart disease and stroke. So people live two years longer and eventually develop a cancer. Uh, as we've heard from Jim, there are rapid development uh, in cancer treatment today, immunotherapy. However, it's been estimated if we were to cure all cancers uh, today, life expectancy would increase by two years. And the reason is that once you've been cured from your cancer, you go on to develop Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease. So the way medicine is administered and thought of today is in this highly siloed organization does not take into account that the major driver of all of these diseases that are highlighted on the slides are driven by aging. And one reason why this hasn't been paid attention is because until recently, we thought that aging was not a variable that we could interact with or modify. So out of this came the geroscience concept, 
which originated from uh, Gordon Lithgow at the Buck Institute a number of years ago. And this is the idea that we might be able to cure the chronic disease of aging by focusing on aging itself. Now this seemed at that time a pretty radical idea. And I can tell you that from the medical standpoint, from the medical world, which is based and structured financially and, and culturally on these silos, it is still a radical idea. However, uh, we're, we're making inroads. So our goal at the Buck Institute in the immediate future, which is, as I, as I described, the one that we can impact on, is to actually really change the trajectory that, that's shown here, is to increase what we call the health span, and make people live better, not, not only longer, but also live better longer. So you've heard about aging, and, and this is a term that is being tossed around in, in, a, in a very sort of easy way. We all think we know what aging is. Um, however, the science of aging is still in its infancy. And, and this is what I want to spend a few minutes in trying to address. Really, what is aging, and, and can we change it? So in this picture that I'm showing you, a 1940 uh, pickup truck, uh, intu intuitively, you don't need a, a medical doctor or any kind of a training to recognize this is an old truck. It is old, it's, its wheels are busted, it is rusty, it's been left in a barnyard, uh, unoccupied. It is actually 78 years old, 1940. This truck is exactly the same age. And so here comes a change in, in your thinking. Uh, what you thought was old is actually not old, and the difference between these two trucks is one was in the hands of a collector who has very uh, 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 carefully uh, maintained it and, and replaced every single piece as it became old or, or, or disabled. In effect, this truck in, in 19, the truck on the right is exactly the same uh, age as, as the one on the left, but it has a different biological age. And this is, here, here comes a, a concept that the field describes as we, we all have a chronological age, which is the number of years that we've lived, but we all have a different biological age. And among your friends, if you are getting to be around 60 or 70, you probably know some people who have aged better than others. And, and so there is incredible variability in the trajectory of how we individually live. And these trajectories are actually highly predictive of how long and how well uh, people will end up living. So our key uh, understanding is trying to see, to understand, to, to, to study what are the mechanisms that underlie these different trajectories uh, between people. Uh, in the case of the car, this was a, a collector. In the case of us, the science is emerging, showing that aging is a failure of maintenance and repair. Just as, in, as, as for the truck, as the collector was replacing and repairing, we are, have built in, in, in ourselves a number of, of repairing and maintenance systems. These systems actually are at play throughout your life. Um, we are not aware of this, most of us are not aware of this, but your skin turns over every 20 days, your bone turns over every, uh, uh, every few years. So pretty much every cell in our organism is turned over, fixed and repaired. Our DNA is being repaired on a, on a constant basis. And so there is evidence that a, a lot of the pathways that we uh, are looking for that are able to modulate the rate of aging actually an activation of these repair and maintenance program. And so when 20 years ago when the Buck Institute was founded on the heels of a, a few discoveries that really changed our way of thinking about aging. People had always wondered can we actually activate repair and maintenance program and the answer is yes we can. So first experiment uh, uh, among a group of scientists who, who really changed the way we were thinking about aging is the work of Cynthia Canyon, a colleague of mine at UCSF in San Francisco, who was among the first to identify single mutations uh, that it could actually change the rate of aging. And so this experiment was done in a little tiny worm, it's shown here. It's, it's, it's about the size of a comma on the right side there. Um, it is called C. elegans because it is very elegant, the way it uh, threads its way through uh, Petri dishes. Um, it lives 20 days, uh, which might seem crazy to actually study a, such a short-lived animal and to think that this might have any implications on human living, but I will show you how it does. And what Cynthia was able to show is that a single mutation in a gene called DAF2 doubled its lifespan. 
Uh, really remarkable finding at that time, but not quite as remarkable as what she did as the next experiment, which uh, was the removal of the gonads. Uh, gonads, for those of you who are not scientific, uh, uh, is, are the sexual organs. And when I talk about this, I usually see people squirming in their chairs, so <laughs> just wanted you to be aware this is not something we're considering for humans. But <laughs> this, the remarkable finding is, is now this worm lived 10 times as long. And so what this data actually highlighted in a way that really inflamed uh, the public and the scientists' imagination is this incredible life potential that was essentially hidden in this worm and could be unleashed. Now, m one thing that has emerged in, in, in recent past is that this incredible plasticity or life potential that happens in the worm it's unlikely, although I hate to say this because it makes me look like a pessimist and a curmudgeon, uh, it's unlikely to happen in, in, in humans because what we have seen is that the closer we move in the evolutionary tree, the harder it is to increase lifespan. However, we believe that in most animal species, there is a potential for a really significant increase in lifespan. So one thing to note also, this is a mutation in a gene, so a single mutation out of a genome that has 100 billion base pair, one mutation causes this. We're not about to enter mutations in the human population. This is actually one of the taboo areas. No one is thinking about doing this. So the, the next question is, can we actually identify environmental modifications that are able to modulate lifespan? And believe it or not, this is an experiment that was conducted in the 1930s by Clive McKay, Rockefeller University at the time, uh, and showing that um, you could actually do something pretty dramatic in terms of li lifespan in rats and in mice, and it's since been shown in pretty much every species in which it has been tested, including in primates, recently in marmoset, is that by restricting the calorie intake, simply <clears throat> decreasing the amount of food that an animal eats, you can also dramatically increase lifespan. Again, uh, I'm showing you a life curve, so we're starting with 100 animals, Normal, anim normal mice live about three years, 36 months. You restrict, so these mice are eating as much as they want. You now calculate this amount and you say, you put mice in another cage and you restrict this amount by 25%. Their lifespan increases by 10%. Up to 55, 65%, you can see more than 50% increase in lifespan. Now mice are much closer to us and actually in the marmoset, the primate in which calorie restriction was tested, it increased lifespan up to 20 and 30 percent. So remarkable finding with relevance to humans. Now obviously if you continue uh, calorie restriction, you end up in malnut malnutrition. There's a fine balance uh, to, be, to, to be struck there. However, this study really highlighted again, even in, in mammals, an incredible life potential and vital what we call vitality potential. So scientists have been uh, busy trying to understand what is the molecular underpinning for, the, for these changes. And I'm showing you a, here a, sum, a summary of work uh, trying to map the pathways between calorie restriction and increased lifespan. Now I should say also, when lifespan increases under calorie restriction, we've also been able to show that health span increases as well. So these mice are not living only longer, they're living better and more healthy which is exactly what we're trying to focus on at, at this time. So a number of things have been uh, identified. The graph is complicated. I want you to uh, point two really critical aspects. One is that these pathways, these genes, for example, TOR is one that will come back in the discussion because this is the target for which we have drugs that are actually in the clinic today in humans and could potentially be used in the future. So TOR, for example, is conserved across species going from C. elegans and mammals. And this is something that no one could have predicted, that by studying this little lowly worm, uh, we might be able to identify players that actually are conserved in mammals all the way to humans. The same goes for ins insulin signaling right here, which is one of the major pathways associated uh, with aging. This is the work uh, in large part of uh, Linda Partridge, actually one of your uh, 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 most famous scientists here uh, in, 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 in England. So incredible amount of detailed knowledge and, and this science is continuing to emerge. Today we have identified more than 800 genes that actually are able to modulate lifespan in C. elegans. So what we thought at first was the exception, 
uh, I should say, before the work of Cynthia Kenyon, people thought that aging was caused by so many genes that you could actually never interfere with the process. And the, ident the, the identification of a single gene that could have such dramatic effect was really um, uh, changing uh, the whole field and led to the funding of um, the Buck Institute, where, where I work in 1999. Uh, just a, a little bit of a sort of shameless self-promotion. Um, we are, uh, we were the first freestanding research institute focused on the bio biology of aging. Uh, today we have 200 employees uh, from over 30 different countries, so we're a not-for-profit uh, research institute. Our mission is to end the threat of age-related diseases, um, and uh, we have a beautiful IMP uh, built campus, uh, 250,000 square foot, uh, just north of San Francisco, so come to visit if you are in the Bay Area. And uh, we've created the first PhD program in the biology of aging. And to finish, I want to uh, 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 briefly discuss, if I have a few more minutes, uh, a story that um, uh, Jim alluded to. This is the story of Synolytics. So this uh, is our faculty. We have 20 faculty members. And the story I'm going to tell you for a minute is, uh, was built by uh, Judy Campisi, uh, one of our uh, scientists, and it relates to cell senescence and aging. So this is a normal mouse aging. This is the same mice uh, at about the equivalent of 60 years old, and it has by that time accumulated a number of abnormal cells that we call senescent cells. These senescent cells accumulate in all of us, starting at age 20 to 25, and they grow in number during aging. We used to think they were an anti-cancer mechanism because this is a way that the cells respond when they detect that they might become cancerous. However, what has emerged is that they are actually secreting uh, uh, what we call the SASP. This is the work of Judy Campisi. These SASP are mediators uh, that lead to chronic inflammation. It turns out that chronic inflammation is one of the major pathways that drives all of these chronic diseases of aging. Um, so we, you've seen this slide from Jim. Already, I'll show it again. This is the mouse, a normal aged mouse. Uh, it suffers all, all kinds of uh, uh, debilitating conditions. This is the same mouse that has undergone uh, uh, synolytic therapy. It lives 35% uh, 35, 35 longer and has also a dramatic extension of health span. It has lost uh, all of these manifestations of aging. Great promise. Based on this, um, Judy and um, uh, a serial entrepreneur called Ned David and Jan van Dersen at the Mayo Clinic started a company called Unity, um, which uh, is, is really, we believe, will be uh, one of the key turning points in the whole landscape of commercial development in the aging space. So uh, uh, Unity was launched at the Buck in 2011. They initially raised $170 million. Their IPO was in May 2018. They have a current market cap of $500 million. They've started amazingly enough, and this, is, this really illustrates the dramatic acceleration that we see in the field. After being in existence for seven years, they entered the clinic in July 2018 uh, for the treatment of neosteoarthritis. Now, the second remarkable thing is that the same drug that is being used for neosteoarthritis will next enter clinical trials for glaucoma, an eye disease. And I think this is really speaks to what the aging field is going to be doing. So uh, I get asked quite often, what can I do today? My nightmare vision of what the Buck Institute will do, and this is my last slide, um, uh, is, is to create drugs that will allow people to not exercise and eat anything they want and, uh, and create a, a generation or a country of, of couch potatoes. Um, so I, I think, uh, all of these interventions are being studied, and uh, many of them will actually change the course of, of life expectancy in the future. My favorite is exercise. 40% um, decrease all around mortality, decrease cancer, decrease cardiovascular, decrease diabetes. The more exercise you do, the better. So this is, um, this, if this were a pill, this would be a multi-billion dollar pill, so it's never too late to start. Uh, we actually are studying how exercises mod modulate the aging pathway. Uh, we'll start, we start, stop here, and I want to thank you uh, for uh, your attention.